Mulțumim lui Dumnezeu pentru dimineața aceasta, pentru oportunitatea pe care o avem să fim din nou împreună la părtășie, să fim în jurul cuvântului lui Dumnezeu, El să ne binecuvinteze pe fiecare, să binecuvinteze alegerea care am făcut-o să stăm în prezența Lui și să dorim să creștem în relația noastră cu Domnul. Înainte să încep, două anunțuri scurte. Unii dintre frații coordonatori în departamentul de familie au început deja să vă contacteze și vă rugăm să, să le faceți slujba, să zic așa, mai ușoară, legat de anumite informații, număr de telefon pentru soț, soție, ca aceste grupe de WhatsApp care vrem să le pornim să pot să fie, să zic așa, puse, puse în acțiune cât de repede. Deci vă rugăm să, să fiți alături de noi și să ne ajutați în această direcție. A second announcement in regards to an opportunity as an evangelistic outreach opportunity on August 18th or 19th on a Saturday, a group of us will be going to Crescent City, California, where they open up uh, one of the local prisons there and you have an opportunity to just do pre prison outreach. So young men or women are, uh, that would like to be involved in this uh, ministry, please reach out to myself, Fratele Claudio Lazar also has been involved every year. It's a great opportunity to just get out there and just share the gospel, and you would be surprised how open people are to listen. They have a lot of time in prison, so they just sit there and they'll listen to you, and you can share the gospel, and it's also a good way for you to sharpen yourself in sharing the word of God with other people. We talked last week about how as we go into the summer months, there's a lot of indecency that's out there and uh, it leads to debauchery, it leads to a sinful attitude by a lot of people. It gets warmer and people just tend to take layers off, layers of clothes, and at one point there's just no more to take off, right? And the society that we live in promotes a lot of the indecency that we see around. And what we saw last week, am văzut săptămâna trecută, că problema poftei, în Matei capitolul 5, versetele 28 la 30, de fapt este o problemă a inimii, o persoană care are probleme din punct de vedere al vederii, nu se poate abține de la anumite lucruri, de fapt are o problemă în inimă, o inimă care este bolnavă și trebuie să fie vindecată. We saw Proverbs 4.23 that talks about the heart and the importance of guarding our heart. Guard your heart above everything else for out of it pour the issues of life. So it's important for us as believers to always be on guard what comes into our hearts. And we saw last week that in order for us to protect our hearts, we must make a covenant with our eyes, the things that come in through our eyes. We shared how in 2 Timothy 2.22, a very practical way for us to protect our eyes is to bounce our eyes, right? Flee, run away from whatever it is that comes into your way. Then pursue righteousness, which means get the word of God on the inside of you. And then accountability with those that seek the Lord out of a pure heart. So make a covenant with your eyes. Then in order to keep a pure heart, Cut off those opportunities that lead to sin, that lead to lust in the life of an individual. So there might be issues having to do with the computer. It might be issues that have to do with your phone. Being in certain locations that are very tempting, cut those off from your life. And finally, we learned to think about the eternal consequences or ramifications. The things that we do on earth will have consequences that resound in eternity. The focus last week was very much on what I do and my responsibility in making sure that I stay pure. But as we look at the Word of God this morning, we find out that as individuals, and especially as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can also help other people in their process of remaining pure in their life of faith. 
There's something that I can do and there's something that you can do in order to help individuals in their purity. Obviously, as I mentioned, it's my responsibility not to look. It's my responsibility to cut off things from my life that can lead to sin, but other individuals can also be helped if I do certain things to help them in their life of purity. And if we look in this passage this morning, I read from Matthew chapter 18, we see once again very, very hard words. Just like last week, in this passage, Jesus talks about cutting off your hand. Just like in last week's passage, Jesus talks about plucking out your eyes. But in this context, he's talking about something a little bit different. If last week he was saying, if you look, you're already sinning. This week he's saying, through your actions, you can make someone else sin. Look at verse 6. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. It's possible to make a good Christian brother or sister, someone that's striving to love the Lord, it's possible because of my behavior. It's possible because of my words. It's possible because of the way that I dress to lead that person into sin. And I know that's not a popular message in the 21st century, but it is in the Word of God, and we want to address it this morning. You and I have the opportunity to help someone be pure in their relationship with the Lord, or we can lead them towards sin. And if we look at the words of Jesus Christ, we see that Jesus is very upset with people that cause others to sin. In fact, Jesus is so upset with those individuals that he is ready to destroy them. He's ready to pour his wrath upon them using such extreme language that it would be better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and for them to be thrown into the sea. And if we look throughout Scripture, we see how the enemy, how the devil, infiltrates into the life of the Israelites. He infiltrates into the life of the church. He infiltrates into the life of the believer through sexual sin in order to lead God's people astray. If we look, even Jesus Christ, who was and is God, had one disciple that infiltrated, and at one point the Bible says that Satan entered Judas, and Judas ended up selling Jesus and contributed to Jesus' crucifixion. If we look in the Word of God in Revelations, we see the church of Pergamos. In Revelations 2, verse 14, Jesus says this about them. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to be a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So there's one of the churches, one of the seven churches, they're dealing with some issues in the church because there are people there that are becoming a stumbling block for the members of the church. And the two ways that they're becoming a stumbling block, number one, they are promoting food that is given to idols and they are promoting promiscuous living or sexual immorality. Things have not changed. The devil continues to use the same tax tactics to infiltrate within the church and into the life of believers. He wants to use idolatry. So things that you might think are innocent. Well, the kids are just playing. This is not a big deal. We're just going to go visit this monument. The devil uses 
subtle cultural norms in order to infiltrate idolatry into our families, into our homes, and into the church community. And we have to be vigilant and we have to watch out and protect one another. Hallelujah. But then the enemy also uses infiltration to bring sexual immorality within the family and even within the church setting. So be aware as a man, as a woman of God, that I don't become and that you don't become a stumbling block where the devil infiltrates with sexual immorality within my family or within the community where I become a stumbling block for others. So what we'll do this morning is we're going to look at a few principles from Matthew chapter 18 on how we can help those around us to be pure before the Lord. What is my contribution to help someone else be more pure before the Lord? And you know, it's not rocket science. It's not something profound that I'm going to be teaching you. You're able to help someone. It all boils down to, it might not even be your words. It's not sitting down and talking through something. It might just be something as simple as putting on another layer of clothing. And again, I know that sounds outdated, but it might be that simple. It might just be not saying certain words that are coarse and are not fit for a man or a woman of God. It might be that simple. So let's look at our passage this morning. How do we help people around us? How do we help our brothers and sisters in Christ to live a life of purity? Cum putem să ajutăm pe cei din jurul nostru să trăiască o viață de curăție înaintea Domnului? Și în primul rând, să-i ajutăm pe cei din jur în viața lor de curăție, e important să fim sensibili la slăbiciunile lor. Be sensitive to the weakness of others. And I already read verse 18, but look at the first part. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin. Whoever causes them to sin. The idea here is that I can cause another believer to sin. Let that sink in for a moment. You and I have the power, if you will, if it's directed in the wrong direction, to cause another individual to stumble and to fall. I'm able to see the weakness in the life of an individual, and I can either be sensitive and say, how can I help this person so that this weakness is not something that's going to make them fall, and I can strengthen them, or I can exploit that weakness. I can take advantage of the weakness that is in that person's life, and I can contribute to their fall. If we look at Jesus' times, when people went to the temple, the money changers and the religious leaders, they exploited or they took advantage of the people going to the temple to bring a sacrifice. And they would charge them large amounts of money for a sacrifice that shouldn't have cost that much. The money changers, the religious leaders, they could have been sensitive and they could have said, man, this person is coming a long distance. I'm going to help them out. I'm going to make things easy for them. But instead, they took advantage of the individuals for their personal gain. If you see a beggar that's blind on the street corner and they're begging, you can be sensitive to his situation. Man, this person needs help. He can't see he needs a sandwich, so maybe you go give him a sandwich or you give him a dollar. That's being sensitive to someone's need and their weakness, right? They can't see. Or you can exploit and you can take advantage of the fact that the individual is not able to see. And as they pass by, you put out your foot and you trip them. They fall over and you actually take their money. That's taking advantage of another person's weakness. And I know this illustration seems very extreme, but the way that society functions allows for people to take advantage of a person's weakness. And if we get down to very practical things in our life, a man is affected very much 
in the things that he sees. And as a woman, as a sister in Christ, the way that you can help him is in the way that you dress. His weakness can be covered, at least when we're together within the body of Christ, when we spend time in fellowship, in the way that you treat him, that you treat brothers and sisters in Christ, in the way that you dress. A woman is more of an emotional being. So in a situation, as a man, especially young guys, you're looking to get married, you can be sensitive to the emotions of a young woman and you be careful around her with the things that you say that will stir up emotions or you can take advantage of those emotions. And as a guy, you take advantage of a young lady and you play with her feelings. You tell her that you're serious about the future and about getting married when in fact you are not. Be sensitive to the areas of weakness in a person's life. If as a guy struggles more with his eyes, make sure that as a woman you do your part to protect him in that area. If you realize as a man that a woman struggles more with her emotions, make sure that you do your part in order to protect her in the area of her emotions. And I know that this might come across like we're being legalistic and we're just preaching certain do's and don'ts. I want to go back to the fact that this is a matter of the heart. If as a child of God, my heart is to glorify God and to protect my brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm going to do whatever it takes in order not to be a stumbling block. And society tells us that we need to have our rights. So if you want to express yourself in a certain way, then do it. But if you express yourself in that way, realize that you are trampling on the conscience. You are trampling on the weaknesses of other individuals that you could be helping. It's not just about you. We don't live in community by ourselves. We live in community with other individuals. The Bible here talks about little ones, people that might be small in the faith or they were just born again and they still are dealing with certain struggles in their life. And as a mature Christian, our responsibility is to make sure that we help them not to stumble more, but we help them to grow stronger in their faith. And if that means I need to put on a sweater, I'm going to do it for the glory of God, and I'm going to do it to help my brother. If that means that I'm not going to play with the gal's emotions, then it's very easy for me not to do that as a young man and exploit another person's feelings. Another principle in protecting the purity of others, be careful what you offer those around you. Ai grija ce oferi altora. Verse 7, Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. So we live in a world of offenses. Everywhere you go, everywhere you look, there are offenses and you can't get out of the way. If you walk to the store, there's going to be an offense there. If you're going to school, there's going to be something there. Offenses are everywhere. And I want you to imagine the world for a moment that it's like a shopping mall with many glass displays. As you're walking through the mall of life, you cannot completely eradicate all of the displays that are there. You do your best to cover your eyes, put your head in the ground. You cannot eliminate the offenses that are on display. But our verse is telling us it's not just about the display. Imagine that there's an individual at one of the mall stores that is sitting there dressed very indecently and calling you in to come into the store. Jesus is saying, yeah, the offenses are going to be there. They're on display. They're, they're in the glass case. But don't be the person that is sitting there and drawing people in and inviting them into stumbling and a sinful attitude. 
Don't be the seducer, in other words. Don't be the one that's offering something that is inappropriate and that is ungodly. And if we look in the Word of God, we see Proverbs chapter 7 is the chapter about the adulterous woman or the seductress, the one that lures people in. And there are certain things that she does, and it's very important, especially for young people, that you don't find yourself practicing the habits of the seductress woman that's offering something, but she's offering the wrong things. She's not offering to take you to prayer. She's not offering to be praying for you. She's not offering for you to be reading the Word of God. And if we look at Proverbs chapter 7 together, we see in verse 10, And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. So there's this seductive woman, and she has very specific intentions. She has a crafty heart. She's out on town, and she's going to deceive a young man that is devoid of understanding. The guy doesn't have very much discernment. He doesn't have very much discernment, and she's going to target this particular individual. Do you know what the first, the first weapon in the arsenal of the seductress woman is? She's dressed like a harlot. Wow. The first weapon in the arsenal of many people that want to lead you astray have to do with the what you see initially as you go to the place where the party's at, to the place where people are hanging out. You can see in the way that people conduct themselves who they are. And obviously there are exceptions, but in general, if you look at an individual and you see their dress, that can tell you a lot about the individual, especially if their intention is to lure you and to seduce you. But the passage continues in verses 11 and 12. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was outside, at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. Loud and rebellious. And I know that for young people, sometimes there's this idea, well, I'm just going to get someone's attention. I'm just going to be loud. I'm just going to not follow all the rules because that's the cool thing to do. Being loud and rebellious, you're right. It will attract attention. But I want you to know that it attracts the wrong attention. It attracts the attention that down the road is going to cause you a lot of pain and suffering, and it's going to cause you tears. So don't attract that kind of attention. And verse 12, so she caught him and kissed him. Such brazen behavior and attitude. The woman doesn't know this guy, and she goes up to him and kisses him. Very similar to what Hollywood promotes through the one night stand. You don't know someone, but you're going to be with them because you love them at first sight. And I want to just alarm, sound the alarm as a young person. Young lady, if a guy comes up to you and he makes advances on you, that guy's not for you. His intentions are not pure. If someone doesn't know you, but they want to have a physical relationship with you, According to the word of God, you should flee. You should tell your parents, you should walk away, and you should erase that person's phone number from your phone. Amen. A lot of the seduction that happens today isn't even face-to-face -face anymore. More and more of the seductive behavior happens on social media. Someone will reach out to you through your Instagram account and you start a relationship with that person that might be a 50-year-old man living out of his basement and you think that it's an attractive 18, 20-year-old guy and much of human trafficking that happens today starts in that way where individuals lure young women, young men online and they gain their trust to the point where the young person goes away willingly. So be aware. Be aware what people are offering you. Not everyone wants to give you 
something good. In fact, we live in a fallen world where people offer you the forbidden fruit. Do you remember Eve in the Garden of Eden? She was offered something that looked so good. It was so appealing to the eyes. And what people offer the young generation that we live in is often so shiny. It seems so good. It seems so attractive. It seems to give you such a high. But down the road, it leads to destruction and it can lead to death. So be aware. And the last thought that I want to share with you this morning in protecting the purity of others is be harsh with yourself. I know that a lot of times we notice other people's issues. We point out that guy's not, you know, that gal's not dressed right. That person said this. Let's be harsh with ourselves. Let's be harsh with our own conduct, with our own behavior, with our own words. Verse 8 says, If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. We find the same language in Matthew 18, as I mentioned, that we found in Matthew chapter 5 last week. Well, last week it was Hey, be careful, cut things off from your life so that you don't look. The context today is, hey, cut things off from your life so that you don't make someone else look. It's just as dangerous to become the one that's provocative, to become the one that's the seducer. So make sure that you cut out. We need to make sure that we cut out things from our life that can make us Step into that role. The life of a Christian is a life of self-denial. As a believer, whether you feel like it or not, there are things that you give up. When we say that we follow the Lord, we are saying, I no longer live. It's Christ that lives in me. I'm a son. I'm a daughter of the king. I don't conduct myself like the world I conduct myself as a son or a daughter of the king. And that means that I give up certain things. That means that I live according to the word of God. Are we ready to make that kind of a commitment? And as I close this morning, I want to circle back to the fact that the issue of lust is a heart issue. And last week, we talked about how if you're dealing with that, you have to come before the Lord in repentance, and you have to say, God, help me. And God is the one through the Holy Spirit that's going to deliver you. But I want to say the same thing this morning. If you are someone that is provocative, if you are someone that your tendency is to always want to come out and show your merchandise and offer people to see something exciting... That also needs to be a moment of repentance this morning where you come before the Lord, where I come before the Lord and we say, God, help me to be someone that helps others rather than someone that makes others stumble. Help me to be a son or a daughter of the king that looks at the things that you desire from me and not what I desire. Help me not to look at the forbidden fruit as something to be desired, but help me to look at living a life of holiness. Help me to look at being pure and helping others be pure for you so that my family and I and the local community can serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Amen.